My name is Jack Carver, and this happened to me on October 23rd, 1999. I still remember it like it was yesterday. You see, I don't work your average 9 to 5. No spreadsheets or water cooler gossip for me. I'm part of a specialized unit. A unit most people think only exists in bad horror movies. We hunt the things that go bump in the night. The creatures hidden in the shadows of myth and whispered rumors. The call came in late. A string of disappearances up in the Pacific Northwest, centered around a sprawling stretch of old-growth forest. Hikers going missing. Search and rescue teams finding nothing but scraps of half-eaten trail mix. Locals started whispering about Bigfoot, but that never sat right with me. There's a scent to those big fellas. A musk that lingers for days after they've moved on. This had a different stink to it. Cold, metallic, like the air right before a lightning storm. I shipped out with my team. Williams, a grizzled veteran with more confirmed kills under his belt than any of us, and Thompson, a bright-eyed rookie fresh out of the academy and itching to prove herself. We landed in a logging town on the edge of the forest, the kind of place where everyone knows your name and a stranger turning up raises eyebrows. We flashed some fake badges, said we were with Fish and Wildlife, and hunkered down in a seedy motel to plan our first sweep. The terrain was brutal. Thick, ancient trees blocked out the sunlight. The forest floor was a tangled carpet of moss and ferns, every fallen log a potential hiding place. We moved slow, scanning every inch of our surroundings for any sign of our quarry. It felt like the woods themselves were watching us, holding their breath. By the third day, we still hadn't found anything resembling a trail. The locals were right about one thing. Whatever was out there was smart. It left no tracks, no scat, no broken branches. The tension gnawed at us. Williams was getting twitchy. Thompson was starting to doubt herself, and even I was beginning to wonder if we were chasing shadows. Then came the break. A flicker of movement in the undergrowth. A flash of something wrong. It moved too fast to be an animal, too upright for a bear. We gave chase, adrenaline pumping through our veins. The trees thinned, giving way to a rocky clearing. That's when we saw it. It was tall, at least seven feet at the shoulder, with skin a mottled gray-green, stretched tight over bulging muscles. Its head was long and narrow, its eyes black pits that reflected no light. But it was the arms that made my blood run cold. They were too long, tipped with sickle-like claws that gleamed in the filtered sunlight. The creature didn't roar or charge. It just tilted its head, studying us with a chilling intelligence. Something about those eyes. They weren't just animal eyes. There was a cunning in them, a calculating coldness that set my teeth on edge. Williams was the first to act. He raised his rifle, the sharp crack of the shot echoing through the trees. The creature jerked, a spray of inky black blood staining the rocks behind it. But it didn't go down. Instead, it turned towards us, and a scream tore from its throat, a high-pitched, keening wail that sent shivers down my spine. It was moving, a blur of gray and claws impossibly fast. Thompson didn't stand a chance. One swipe of its claws and she was down, her scream cut brutally short. Williams and I opened fire. Our bullets found their mark, peppering the creature with holes. Thick black blood splattered the ground, the metallic tang of it hanging heavy in the air. The creature staggered, roared, not in pain, but in rage. Then it whirled, vanishing back into the trees with unnerving speed. The forest fell silent, but the echo of that horrible scream still hung in my ears. We found Thompson where she had fallen. What the creature left behind was barely recognizable. My stomach churned, and I fought the urge to vomit. Williams didn't say a word. He just looked at me, his face etched with a grim determination. I saw the same reflection in his eyes as I felt in my own gut. This was far from over. We patched ourselves up, radioed for backup, then set to tracking the creature. 
The blood trail was easy to follow at first, but then it petered out, like the thing had simply melted back into the forest. The arrival of backup was less reassuring than I'd hoped. More grunts in camo gear, the same wide-eyed confusion we'd all worn a few days ago. Command set up a perimeter. Containment protocols ringing in my ears like a bad joke. Contain what, exactly? A whirlwind with teeth? Williams vanished into the command tent, leaving me to babysit the newbies. He emerged an hour later, face drawn. We got orders, he said, his voice low. They want us to lure it in. The plan was insane, as most plans involving monsters tend to be. I'd be the bait. It took every ounce of my willpower not to argue, to yell about Thompson and how we were outmatched. But some battles aren't won with shouting. That night I lay in the center of the clearing, rifle in my sweating hands, heart pounding against my ribs. The forest was alive with whispers and rustles, every shadow holding the potential for those black, unblinking eyes. It came not with a charge, but materialized from the darkness like a conjuring trick. One moment the clearing was empty, the next, it stood there, studying me. Moonlight glinted off its claws. I squeezed the trigger, the gunfire shattering the forest silence. The creature flinched, a spray of black blood, but then it was moving, too damn fast. My shots went wild as I scrambled back, scrabbling for my sidearm. Then Williams was there, his rifle spitting fire the creature finally roaring in true pain. Branches snapped, the ground trembled as it thrashed and twisted, wounded but far from dead. Backup converged, flashlights slicing through the night, more bullets tearing into the creature. It twisted, not towards us, but deeper into the trees. It moved with a desperation that sent a chill through me. Was it retreating or leading us somewhere? The command truck was a fortress of flashing lights. Medics swarmed what was left of the creature, strapping it to a gurney, shouting technical terms I didn't understand. Its ragged breaths echoed in the night, a horrible, wheezing counterpoint to the organized chaos. William stood near the rear of the truck, his expression unreadable. You did good, Carver, he said, offering me a hand. Relief warred with unease a sour taste in my mouth, a flicker of movement in the open truck doors, not the creature, but something small, huddled in the shadows. It looked like a child, thin limbs wrapped tightly around itself, staring out with those same dead black eyes. My voice failed me before I could speak, a strangled gasp caught in my throat. Williams's grip tightened. Don't, he warned, but the order was unnecessary. We both knew. There wasn't anything we could do. The truck doors slammed shut. Engines roared. And like that, they were gone. The government-sanctioned monster truck, leaving only the tang of blood and exhaust in the cold forest air. The aftermath was a whirlwind of paperwork and debriefings. Euphemisms like asset containment and national security risks were thrown around while I tried to scrub the image of that small, terrified figure from my mind. Thompson's face floated before me as I filled out reports with hands that still shook. Officially, the forest incident was blamed on a bear attack. Hikers were warned, trails were closed, the world moved on as it always does. But Williams and I, we knew. We'd seen the truth behind the carefully papered over lies. Monsters are real. The government knows, and sometimes the people who get called in to handle things, the ones with badges and guns and brave faces, they don't make it out with their humanity intact. They offered me a promotion, a cushy desk job away from the front lines. I turned it down, told them I'd rather be out in the field, facing what might be lurking in the darkness head on. Because the truth is scarier than any monster I've hunted, there are things the government can contain, and then there are things they unleash. And sleep doesn't come easy when you don't know which kind is waiting for you out there in the shadows. My name is Rowan Carter, 
and this happened to me on October 12, 1997. I was a park ranger back then, fresh out of the academy, posted to Olympic National Forest in Washington State. Bigfoot country if you believe the stories, but I always figured those sightings were more likely fueled by bad moonshine than actual monsters. Turns out, I was about to be proven dead wrong. Before all hell broke loose, it was honestly the perfect job. Hiking, patrolling the backcountry, the kind of peace and quiet a city boy like me didn't even know existed. My partner, old-timer named Granger, was the stereotypical gruff mountain man, but had a heart of gold under the prickly exterior. We got the call about the missing campers on a Tuesday. Group of college kids, dumb, reckless, and ill-prepared ventured off trail and hadn't been heard from since. Routine stuff, sadly. Probably got turned around, maybe a twisted ankle. We'd find them in a day or two, cold and sheepish. That's what I told myself anyway. We started our search in the general area of their last known coordinates. Olympic is massive, old-growth forest, so dense the sunlight barely filters through. Gives the whole place an eerie, primeval feel, especially as the afternoon shadows started to lengthen. That's when we found the first traces of them. A shredded backpack, scraps of torn clothing snagged on a branch, streaks of dried blood on the leaves. Granger swore under his breath, his face grim. That ain't no bear attack, he muttered. My stomach did a slow, sickening flip. Something about the scene felt... wrong, unnatural. The blood spatters were too high, the torn fabric had puncture marks I couldn't explain. And everywhere, that smell, coppery and rotten, clinging to the air. We followed the trail, if you could call it that. It was like something big and clumsy had thrashed through the underbrush, leaving a path of trampled ferns and snapped branches. As the sun began to dip below the tree line, Granger called a halt, insisted we make camp and continue in the morning. I didn't argue. The forest had eyes on it by then. An oppressive feeling of being watched, hunted. Sleep was fitful. My dreams filled with rustling noises and the gleam of unseen eyes in the darkness. Dawn came as a relief. We packed up quickly, rifles loaded, nerves taut as bowstrings. The trail grew fresher broken saplings, deep gouges in the earth, and more blood. And then we found the clearing, or what used to be a clearing. Now it was a slaughterhouse. Three tents lay in tatters, their contents strewn about like a morbid scavenger hunt. Sleeping bags were ripped open, their stuffing hanging from the trees streaked with crimson. And in the center of it all, the bodies. What was left of them, at least. Two of the campers, a guy and a girl, were barely recognizable. Parts were missing, limbs torn away with grotesque violence. The third body, another girl, was hanging upside down from a tree branch, her throat ripped open. I vomited, the meager contents of my breakfast burning my throat. Granger just stood there, his face like granite. Then he raised his rifle and walked deeper into the clearing, following a fresh set of inhumanely large footprints. I hesitated my instinct screaming at me to run, but some twisted sense of duty compelled me to follow. We stalked our quarry for what felt like hours. The forest floor was a mess of crushed vegetation and those massive footprints. The smell of blood and rot grew stronger with each step. And then we saw it. It was standing on the edge of a ravine, its back to us. Even hunched slightly, it dwarfed Granger, who was a solid six foot two. Its skin was leathery gray, stretched tight over bulging muscles. The head was long and narrow, and when it turned to look over its shoulder, I saw the eyes. Black, empty pits reflecting the dull light. A chill went through me that had nothing to do with the mountain air. This wasn't some undiscovered ape species. This was something older, elemental a piece of the nightmare world bleeding into our own. Granger raised his rifle, took aim. I was too stunned to move. 
even as I realized the sheer stupidity of what he was about to do. One shot against that thing, it was suicide. He squeezed the trigger. The rifle barked, echoing through the trees. The creature jolted, let out a roar that shook the leaves from the branches. Black blood spattered where the bullet had hit, and it whirled, its speed blurring. Granger got off one more shot before the creature was on him. It swatted aside his rifle like a toy, then its claws raked across Granger's chest, flinging him backward. He landed in a tangle of limbs, his scream echoing in the sudden silence. Time seemed to slow. Instinct, that primal urge for survival, took over. I raised my own rifle, a desperate, foolish gesture. The creature stalked toward Granger, who thrashed weakly on the ground, his shirt a spreading stain of red. I fired, emptying the magazine in a frenzy of noise and fear. The creature flinched with each hit, its roar morphing into something like a pained snarl. Thick black blood splattered the ground, but it didn't fall. It turned toward me, its empty eyes locking onto mine. I knew then, with absolute certainty, that I was next. Blindly I fumbled for a reload. My hands shook, the spare magazines clattering against the damp earth. The creature stalked closer, a predator savoring its cornered prey. Granger let out a strangled cry, the sound abruptly cutting off with a sickening wet gurgle. His body lay still, twisted at a grotesque angle. My trembling fingers finally found a fresh magazine. I slammed it home, racking the bolt. The creature was mere yards away now, its stench overwhelming. I raised my rifle, aimed for the center of its massive chest, and squeezed the trigger. Nothing. Click. Empty chamber. Terror washed over me, an icy wave that left me paralyzed. The creature roared, a triumphant, bloodthirsty sound. It lunged, then something slammed into its side with the force of a freight train. The creature staggered, its momentum carrying it crashing into a massive redwood. The impact shook the whole forest floor. It scrambled to its feet, a confused snarl rumbling in its throat. I blinked, disoriented. A truck, military issue, painted in dull camouflage, had appeared out of nowhere, partially concealed by the thick underbrush. Its side door hung open, and a man leaned out, a weapon in his hands that looked like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. He fired. Not bullets, but some kind of crackling energy beam that struck the creature in the chest. It howled and blistering smoke curled where the beam made contact. The creature thrashed, swatting at the air like it was fighting an unseen enemy. The man fired again, and again. The creature stumbled, its movements slowing. Then, with a final tortured roar, it collapsed to the ground, its massive form trembling, then going still. Silence descended, broken only by the rasp of my own breathing. The man jumped out of the truck, two more figures following close behind. They moved with a practiced, efficient sort of urgency, securing the area with practiced ease. One of them, a woman with steely eyes, approached me. Rowan Carter? she asked, her voice crisp and authoritative. I nodded, unable to form words. We need you to come with us, she said. There was no question in her tone. They brought us to a nondescript compound deep in the woods, Granger's body strapped to a gurney, my own wounds hastily bandaged. The place thrummed with a subdued energy, armed personnel moving in and out of bunker-like buildings. The debriefing was a blur. I stumbled through my account, my voice raw. They asked about the creature, its appearance, its behavior. I described what I saw the questions blurring together until my head pounded with exhaustion. We've been tracking that thing for months, someone said, an edge of frustration in his voice. Lost good people to it. Another person, older, with a gaze that seemed to bore right through me, spoke then. You did well, Carter. Survived an encounter most don't. There was something like grim admiration in his voice. They offered explanations, or half-truths at least. Cryptids weren't myths, they said. Remnants of a wilder time, 
creatures that slipped through the cracks of mainstream science. The government knew, had a task force dedicated to containing them. I was a recruit now, whether I liked it or not. Granger didn't make it. Death Certificate listed a wild animal attack to keep his family from agonizing over the gruesome truth. I went to the funeral, stood in the crisp fall air, and lied about the bear that took my friend. In the weeks that followed, they patched me up and put me through the ringer. Drills, tactical training, weapons I'd never imagined. Each night, I closed my eyes and saw the creature. Granger's lifeless stare, the smell of blood and rot clinging to my skin. Part of me wanted to run, to find some semblance of a normal life. But another part, a cold and vengeful part, craved the chance to hunt those that lurk in the shadows, to make damn sure that what happened in that forest never happened again. The day came when they loaded me back into a truck, a new team at my side. Different mission, different creature, same terror lurking deep in the pit of my stomach. They handed me a rifle, the weight of it both familiar and impossibly foreign. Welcome to the front lines, Carter, someone said, his mouth stretching into a smile that didn't reach his eyes. I didn't smile back. Out there, somewhere in the vast wilderness, the monsters waited, and whether I was ready or not, the hunt was on. My name is Evander Knox, and this happened to me on July 22, 2008. Back then, my biggest concern was deciding which bar to hit on Friday nights, not whatever lay in wait out there in the darkness. I was fresh out of college, working a dead-end data entry job, but with a side hustle that was about to change my life. See, I'd always been into the weird stuff. UFO sightings, ghost stories, you name it. When I discovered there were folks out there actively investigating that stuff, people calling themselves cryptozoologists, well, I'd found my passion. I started with online communities and research, then moved to attending conferences and doing small-time fieldwork on the weekends. Imagine my surprise when a government recruiter reached out. Next thing I knew, I was part of a covert team known only as Unit 47. Our mission? Verify, contain, and if necessary, neutralize anomalous creatures. It was the kind of stuff you joked about around a campfire, not something you actually lived. My first real mission took us to Wyoming on the trail of what folks reported as a dog man, a freakishly large wolf-like creature that stalked on two legs. Local ranchers had been losing cattle, and fear gripped the region. Our team was tight-knit. Myself, the rookie, Jensen, our seasoned tracker, and Davis, ex-military and our weapons expert. Wyoming was like nothing I'd known back east. Vast plains stretched to the horizon, and the night sky blazed with a million stars. The isolation hit you, a chilling reminder of how much untamed wilderness was still out there. We spent weeks on recon, setting up cameras and scouring the hills for any sign of our target. Nights were spent under the open sky, scanning the plains with night vision. Nothing broke the monotony but the echoing howl of coyotes in the distance. I began to think it was all a bust, one of those wild goose chases that were part and parcel of our line of work. That all changed on the fourteenth night. Davis had been tracking something unusual on the thermal. A massive figure moving with uncanny speed through the ravines. We got something he said, voice low. And it's big. In minutes we were geared up and on the move, adrenaline spiking my veins. We followed the thermal signature, weaving through gullies and patches of scrub. Something about the way it moved felt wrong, unnatural. And then we found the carcass. It was half-eaten, torn open with brutal strength. My stomach lurched, this wasn't coyote work. Whatever we were dealing with was large and merciless. We spread out, flashlights cutting through the gloom. A growl echoed across the ravine, a low, 
guttural sound that made the hairs on my arms stand on end. And there it was, a monstrous silhouette perched on a ridge, illuminated by the moon. It was far bigger than any wolf I'd ever seen, closer to the size of a bear but with an elongated, powerfully built frame. Its head was wolf-like, but with an unnaturally long muzzle and eyes that glinted with a vicious intelligence. We froze in place, the night wind carrying the scent of blood and musk heavy in the air. Davis raised his rifle, but Jensen touched his arm, shaking his head. No telling what kind of firepower that thing could handle. We needed to gather intel, not start a war we couldn't win. We retreated, keeping our eyes locked on the creature until it disappeared back into the darkness. Every rustle of the wind sounded like its returning footsteps, and sleep was impossible. We radioed back to base, our clipped report filled with as much detail as we could muster. The reply came back grim. Containment protocol was now in effect. We weren't just tracking this thing anymore. We were going to bring it down. Over the next few days, we laid a trap. A fresh carcass as bait. A carefully concealed perimeter rigged with tranquilizer darts. And us hunkered down in a blind, ready to finish the job. The whole thing sat wrong with me. We weren't wildlife control. We were executioners, but orders were orders. Night fell again, thick with tension. The creature was out there. We could feel it. Every creak, every snap of a twig, had us tensing in anticipation. And then, the waiting was over. It materialized out of the darkness, a silent specter drawn to the scent of blood. It approached the carcass cautiously its enormous form rippling with muscle as it tested the air. Jensen whispered the signal, and the tranquilizer darts launched from their hiding places. Three darts found their mark, thudding into the creature's thick hide. For a moment, the only sound was the rasp of its breath. Then it roared, a sound of raw fury that shook the very earth beneath our feet. The creature thrashed, snarling, its eyes blazing. The drugs were slowing it down but not fast enough. It tore at the darts, its claws ripping through its own flesh in frenzied swipes. Then it lunged, not for the carcass but for us. Chaos erupted. Davis opened fire, rifle reports echoing through the night. The creature staggered under the onslaught, but it kept coming. Jensen grabbed me, dragging me out of the blind a split second before the creature crashed through it, splintering the wood into kindling. I scrambled for cover behind a boulder as Davis continued firing. The night was a blur of adrenaline-fueled terror. Flashes of the creature's monstrous form in the moonlight, the acrid smell of gunpowder, and the echoing thunder of gunshots. I fumbled for my own pistol, firing blind bursts at the hulking shadow. Then, a blood-chilling scream cut through the chaos. Davis. I saw it in the chaos, the creature ripping into Davis, its jaws closing around his torso the sickening sound of bone snapping. Jensen was yelling, firing his weapon, trying to draw the creature's attention. I aimed and squeezed the trigger, each shot a prayer. One of my shots must have found its mark. The creature howled again, a pained roar, and whirled away from what was left of Davis. It lunged at Jensen, claws raking across his chest, knocking him to the ground. Blood splattered the rocks. I fired again and again, driven by desperate rage. The creature finally stumbled, its massive form listing awkwardly. It let out a final, shuddering growl and collapsed. Silence descended, punctuated only by Jensen's ragged breaths. I ran to him, heart hammering in my chest. He was still alive, but barely. Blood soaked the front of his shirt, his eyes glazed with pain. Davis was gone. Nothing left but a gruesome crimson stain against the rocks. Get out of here, Jensen gasped, his voice a bloody whisper. Call. Call for evac. I wanted to argue, to drag him to safety, but there was no time. The drugs wouldn't hold the creature forever. I took one last look at Jensen, memorizing a face that I knew. Deep down, I wouldn't see alive again. Then I turned and ran. I sprinted through the night, 
guided only by instinct and the distant lights of our base camp. The creature's roars trailed after me, each one a death knell for the man I left behind. By the time I reached the camp, I was a sobbing, incoherent mess. Choked words spilled out. Creature, attack. Davis dot 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 Jensen dot 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 dead dot evac arrived a frantic blur of helicopters and medics. They descended on the scene I'd fled, but it was too late. All that remained was a bloodbath and the monstrous, still form of the creature. Analysis later revealed the tranquilizers in its bloodproof we'd gotten it, but at an unimaginable cost. The aftermath was the same institutional coldness we'd all come to expect. Debriefings, classified reports, offers for counseling that no one truly took. They patched me up and sent me back home, a ghost haunted by the vacant stares of fallen friends and the chilling echoes of a creature's roar. I never went back to Unit 47. Couldn't bear the thought of facing more of those things, knowing the price that would inevitably be paid. Some nights, I still dream of those Wyoming plains, the vast sky and the monstrous shadow that devoured the life I once knew. They say the government has it all under control, that they're keeping the world safe from the things lurking in the darkness. If that's true, it comes at a heavy cost. That cost is paid in the blood of people like Jensen and Davis, in the shattered lives of those who make it back. My name is Evander Knox, and I survived. But a part of me died out there on those Wyoming plains, devoured by a creature straight out of nightmares. And that... That is the true horror story those in charge will never understand. My name is Will Atwater, and this happened to me in early September of 2011. I was still pretty green with the team back then, full of piss and vinegar. Figured if the legends and old wives' tales were even half true, a fella could make a name for himself out in these woods. Yeah, I was an idiot. Thing is, I've always been more of a city boy. Don't get me wrong, I love a good hike, the smell of pine needles and all that. But there's something about the quiet out in the real wild places that gets under a guy's skin. Used to be. The worst thing I worried about was a bear with an empty stomach. Those, at least, you can see coming. This whole ordeal started because of some missing persons reports. Small town tucked up in the Appalachians. Harmony Falls, West Virginia. Seemed routine enough. Three hikers vanished over a couple of months all within the Blackwater Mountain State Forest. The locals were getting the jitters, and the higher-ups figured sending us in would reassure people, even if we didn't turn up a damn thing. Our crew was the usual. Myself, Riley, a resident wilderness expert, Dr. Hayes, the brains of the outfit, and Carter, our team leader and all-around hard-ass. We set up base camp in a meadow just off the main trailhead, the kind of place picture-perfect enough to lull you into a false sense of security. The first few days were all drudgery, searching grid patterns through the thick underbrush, interviewing folks in town who didn't have much to add, and trying not to swat ourselves senseless from the swarms of mosquitoes. Then came the night that changed everything. I was pulling radio watch, half-dozing in the battered old RV that served as our mobile command center, when static crackled from the speaker. Base camp? This is Riley. Over. His voice was tight, a thread of tension cutting through. I jolted upright, fumbling for the transmit button. Riley? This is Will. What's your status? A pause, then. We got something. Tracks. Not human. Big. Come quick and bring back up. He rattled off coordinates and my heart started hammering a double-time rhythm. Grabbing my gear, I woke up Carter and Hayes. Hayes looked worried, that nervous tick starting up by her eye. Carter just grunted and set his jaw, the look of a man who'd been waiting for this moment his whole career. We reached Riley less than fifteen minutes later, flashlights cutting through the pre-dawn gloom. He stood at the edge of a clearing, 
rifle at the ready. Over there, he whispered, gesturing to the tree line. That's when I saw the footprints. They were massive, at least 18 inches long even on the soft mud, with what looked like claw marks gouged into the earth. Whatever made them walked on two legs, but this was no bear track, no mountain lion. My mouth went dry. Carter crouched down, studying the imprint. Never seen anything like it, he muttered. Riley motioned for us to follow, and we moved into the trees, single file. The forest floor was a mess of broken branches and overturned leaves. Something big and powerful had passed through here and not long ago. The smell hit us first, a coppery tang of blood mixed with something rotten, like meat left out in the sun too long. Then we came across the deer carcass, or what was left of it. The thing had been ripped apart, bones shattered and strewn about like a kid's discarded toys. Hayes bent down, retching a little into the underbrush. Jesus, was all she managed. Carter swore and there was a hint of fear in his eyes that I'd never seen before. Riley, he barked. Eyes up. This thing could still be close. We moved deeper into the woods, the silence oppressive. The first rays of dawn painted the canopy in streaks of pale gold, but the forest floor remained cloaked in shadow. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, had my nerves jangling. Then I saw it. At first, it was just a flicker of movement in my peripheral vision. Then a hunched shape, taller than any man, disappearing behind a tangle of oak trees. My blood ran cold. There, I hissed, pointing. The others whipped around, weapons raised. We crept forward, muscles taut. Rounding a bend, I caught sight of it again, just for a second. It was massive, at least seven feet tall, covered in coarse, dark fur. Powerful corded muscles rippled beneath its skin as it moved with unnatural speed, vanishing into the foliage. Its eyes, I only saw them for an instant as it turned its head, glowed a fiery yellow. What the hell was that? Hayes breathed, her voice shaking. I don't know, Carter said, his voice grim, but I intend to find out. We pressed forward, the creature's trail becoming more obvious. Here, a strange half-eaten animal carcass that looked like a mangled dog. There, a swath of flattened vegetation where something heavy had crashed through the forest. The air hummed with an electric tension I couldn't place. Suddenly, Riley stumbled. We froze, every sense on high alert. His flashlight beam swept the ground, illuminating a thick smear of crimson across the leaves. Blood, he whispered. More worry etched itself onto Hayes's face. The blood trail led us deeper into the heart of the forest. The trees grew thicker, the canopy denser, sunlight barely filtering through. We came upon a small ravine, shrouded in an almost perpetual twilight, and that's when we found the bodies. The first one was strung up in the branches of a tree, clothes torn and shredded, flesh gouged and broken. One of the missing hikers I realized with a jolt of horror. Further into the ravine we found the other two, their bodies desecrated with the same gruesome brutality. Hayes vomited onto the ground, her face pale. I fought the urge to do the same. Whatever we were dealing with, it wasn't just some oversized animal. This was calculated, cruel. Carter surveyed the scene, his lips a thin line. We need to get the hell out of here. Now! His order hung heavy in the air. This wasn't supposed to happen. We were the hunters, not the hunted. But as we turned back, a low growl echoed through the ravine, sending chills racing down my spine. The creature stepped out from the shadows, its form a silhouette against the dim light. Up close, it was even more monstrous than I imagined. Its body was a grotesque mix of human and animal. Powerful, ape-like arms hung low, hands tipped with razor-sharp claws. The legs looked almost canine, bent strangely at the joints, ending in clawed feet. Its torso was vaguely human, but the hunched posture and unnaturally long neck gave it an unsettling alien appearance. 
the head. That's what stuck with me the most. Too wide, too long, with a jaw that jutted out at an impossible angle, filled with rows of jagged teeth. And those eyes, burning like embers in the gloom, devoid of anything resembling human intelligence. It studied us, its head cocking from side to side, a predator assessing its prey. Easy, easy, Carter muttered, his rifle slowly rising. The creature let out another growl, deeper this time, and took a menacing step forward. Fire! Carter roared, and the air filled with the crack of gunshots. The creature screeched, a high-pitched piercing sound that set my teeth on edge. It stumbled backward, bullets tearing into its flesh. But it didn't go down. Blood spattered the forest floor, staining the leaves black. An acrid stench filled the air. The creature snarled, swiping at the air with its claws, fury etched on its monstrous face. Reload! Hayes screamed, her voice tight with terror. We scrambled, fumbling for fresh magazines. Riley jammed a clip into his weapon, and another volley of gunfire rang out. The creature howled, stumbling again. But still, it didn't fall. It lurched forward, a blur of tattered fur and rage. Riley got off one more shot before a massive, clawed hand swept across his chest. I heard his scream, a ragged gasp cut short. He went down in a spray of blood, his body crumpling to the ground. The creature loomed over him, its jaws widening. Riley! Carter yelled, his voice filled with fury and despair. That's when it hit me. There was a primal understanding behind those glowing eyes. This wasn't just some animal attack. It was calculated, sadistic. The creature ripped into Riley's body, a spray of crimson arcing through the air. The screams. I'll never be able to forget the sounds. Carter was firing, a desperate attempt to distract it. Hayes grabbed my arm, pulling me back. We have to go, she cried. Blind panic propelled me. I ran, heart pounding so hard I thought it would burst from my chest. Hayes stumbled beside me, gasping for breath. Behind us, the creature's roars echoed through the trees, mingled with the fading crackle of Carter's gunshots. We burst out of the ravine, scrambling up the steep embankment. I didn't dare look back. We ran through the dense forest, branches whipping at our faces, thorns tearing at our clothes. I don't know how long we ran. Time lost all meaning. Lungs burning, legs screaming. We finally collapsed in a hidden clearing. I lay there, gasping for air, the forest floor beneath me spinning. Hayes sobbed quietly, her body trembling. I couldn't bring myself to say anything. What could I say? Riley was gone. Carter. Chances were, he was gone too, and that thing was still out there. After what felt like an eternity, Hayes forced herself to sit up. We need to radio for help, she said, voice hoarse. Her words jarred me out of my numb haze. A desperate hope flickered within me. Yes, help. We needed backup. We needed... Then I remembered. They couldn't help us. No one could. Hayes reached for the radio at her hip. I put a hand out to stop her. What are you doing? She asked, confusion in her eyes. I took a shaky breath. They can't know about this. They can't know it's real. Hayes stared at me, comprehension dawning in her eyes. The cover-up, she whispered. The government, our employers, knew things existed out here, creatures from nightmares. But they couldn't let that knowledge become public. Panic, chaos, the whole world would unravel. I nodded grimly. We'll say it was a bear attack. Wild animal. It'll be written off as another tragedy. Hayes shuddered, but she understood. It was the only way. It was the lie we had to live with. We stumbled back towards our base camp, weaving a story of panic, confusion, and the relentless power of nature. They'd send in a search party, find what was left of Riley and Carter and the case would be closed. The creature would fade back into the shadows, 
another whispered tale told around campfires. When we reached base camp, it was already swarming with activity. Cleanup crews in unmarked uniforms descended, their faces devoid of emotion. They'd sanitize the scene, erase any trace of what truly transpired. Hayes and I were whisked away, debriefed in a sterile windowless room. Standard amnesia protocol, they called it, though I doubt they could wipe the images from my mind. In the aftermath, I left the unit. Couldn't bear the thought of hunting monsters, only to be hunted myself. Drifted for a while, trying to find a semblance of normalcy. But normalcy was a luxury I could no longer afford. The world wasn't what I thought it was. There were things lurking on the fringes of our reality, hidden in plain sight. And sometimes, on sleepless nights, I feel them watching me. I tell myself it's paranoia, PTSD from that day in the woods. But deep down, I know the truth. The creature from Blackwater Mountain. It's still out there. And maybe, just maybe, it isn't the only one. My name is Caleb Ross, and this happened to me on October 6th, 1991. Back then, I was green, cocky. Thought I worked for some hush-hush paranormal division of the FBI. Turns out, the truth was a hell of a lot weirder Think Less X-Files, more like a tax audit with teeth. Our assignment sounded simple enough. Investigate reports of unexplained activity out in the Cascade Mountains, Washington State. Locals whispering about strange lights, mutilated cattle. You know the drill. Figure out if it's some cult, a hoax, or something else entirely. We had a four-man team. Me, the newbie. Flynn, team leader, built like an oak tree with the temperament to match. Eliza, wildlife expert. All sensible boots and skeptical frowns. And Wilson, resident tech geek. Guy could hack a satellite with a paperclip and a stick of gum, I swear. The trail led us deep into the woods, prime Bigfoot territory. Plenty of jokes were cracked about that, mostly by me, trying to lighten the tension that had settled in as we got further from civilization. It felt old out there, like the trees themselves were holding their breath. Day one was a bust. Drone sweeps, sensor checks... The whole nine yards. We found zero evidence supporting the locals' claims. Eliza even gave me that disappointed but not surprised look reserved for know-it-all rookies. By nightfall, we were setting up camp. And that's when things got weird. Not weird like a blurry Bigfoot snapshot, but weird in a spine-crawling way. The quiet felt wrong. Too heavy. Too thick. It was like all those forest sounds. The rustling leaves, the chirping crickets, were abruptly cut off. I noticed Wilson fidgeting by the campfire, glancing over his shoulder. You feeling something too? I asked him. He just nodded, face tight. Flynn, ever the stoic leader, gave us both a gruff look. Nerves, he muttered. It's your first time out this deep. You'll get used to it. The night dragged on, that oppressive silence pressing down on us. I lay awake, staring at the canvas of our tent, every tiny snap of a twig making me jump. Finally, just before dawn, I heard it. A low whine, mechanical, but mixed with something uncomfortably organic. Imagine a rusty saw blade crossed with a sick animal's growl. It was getting closer. I fumbled for my flashlight, heart pounding. Across the clearing, Eliza sat bolt upright, her expression mirroring my own terror. Flynn moved fast. Wilson, perimeter lights, now. Wilson scrambled to obey. The lights flickered on in a harsh circle, illuminating the inky blackness beyond. They revealed nothing, but the whining was louder, closer. It seemed to be circling us. Up! We're sitting ducks out here! Flynn barked. We stumbled out of our tents, rifles ready. The air buzzed with static, raising the hair on my arms. Then I saw it. A flicker of movement above the tree line, 
just beyond the reach of our lights. Something huge, misshapen, catching a sliver of moonlight. Before I could get a clear look, it was gone, the chilling wine fading back into the darkness. Flynn let out a ragged breath. What the hell was that? Wilson was checking our sensors, thermal, infrared, the whole tech suite. His face was pale. Nothing, he rasped. Nothing showing. Morning came, washed out in gray, the whole world holding its breath. We searched the area, Flynn with his grim efficiency, Eliza tracking any sign, any disturbance on the forest floor. They found nothing. No footprints, no torn branches, nothing that explained the impossible thing we'd all witnessed. Wilson fiddled with his equipment, the tech equivalent of worrying a loose tooth. The readings, he muttered. I don't get it. Whatever it was, it left no trace. It's like it was never even here. Fear was gnawing at me now, that adrenaline crash leaving a shaky exhaustion in its place. I wanted to radio it in, call for backup, get the hell out of there. But Flynn's face was set. We finished the mission, he declared. And that was that. The second night we were on edge. The wine never returned, but the oppressive silence was enough to keep us awake and armed. There was a watch set up, but even Flynn looked rattled, his gruff barks edged with a new tension. It happened just after midnight, a sudden crash from the woods behind Eliza's post. She let out a yelp, flashlight beam wildly cutting into the darkness. Eliza! Flynn's voice was a harsh whisper. Sss! Something ran through. Big! Fast! She sputtered back. We converged on her position flashlight swinging. It looked like a wild charge. Branches snapped, the undergrowth trampled. We followed the track as deep as we dared, but it disappeared abruptly, as if whatever made it had simply vanished. I caught Eliza's eye as we returned to the camp. We shared a silent, panicked look. Things had escalated, and fast. We'd gone from strange lights to whatever the hell had barreled through the woods. Sleep was impossible. I huddled by the embers, trying to calm my racing thoughts. I must have dozed off, because a sudden shout jolted me awake. It was Wilson. He was pointing wildly into the darkness, eyes wide with terror. We followed his gaze. And there, high above the tree line, were lights. Not a singular craft, but a cluster, bobbing gently in the night sky. They pulsed, red, then orange, in a slow, unsettling rhythm. And below them, just visible through the branches, was a shape. It mirrored the movement of the lights, sinuous and sleek, impossibly long. A collective gasp went up. Flynn's grip tightened on his rifle. Open fire, he ordered. Our gunfire ripped through the night. The lights seemed to recoil, the shape below them whipping out of view. Then... Nothing. The lights winked out one by one, leaving us in a darkness that felt even more menacing than before. Silence clung to the trees like a shroud. I held my breath, waiting for a response, some monstrous roar that would shatter the night. But none came. Wilson's voice broke the stillness, shaky and a little too high-pitched. The sensors. They went haywire. For a second there was a reading. Massive. Then it was just gone, like it blinked out of existence. Flynn swore under his breath. The unshakable leader was starting to crack under the pressure. Regroup, he ordered. His voice held a new tremor. Back at camp, the mood was grim. No more jokes, no more pretense of a routine investigation. We huddled together, our flashlights casting a pathetic circle of light into the encroaching darkness. What now? I asked. Nobody answered. What could we do? We were outgunned, outmatched, and in way over our heads. It was Eliza, of all people, who broke the tension. The wildlife expert, the one always armed with a notebook and a skeptical frown, now had a look of hard determination on her face. Whatever we saw, whatever we're dealing with, it's not natural, 
she said, her usually soft voice firm. There's something otherworldly about this. The word hung in the air, a silent admission of what we all feared. It seemed absurd, the kind of thing you scoff at in bad late-night documentaries. But out here, surrounded by a darkness that pulsed with the unknown, it felt more than plausible. It felt like the only explanation. Flynn, ever the pragmatist, scoffed. Aliens now? Give me a break. But his scoff sounded weak, almost desperate. The rest of the night was an agonizing blur. We huddled together for warmth and a meager sense of safety. I barely slept, my mind racing through a hundred horror movie scenarios, each wilder than the last. Dawn came as a relief, though it held little hope. The woods, washed in that pale morning light, seemed deceptively normal. Yet the broken branches and the lingering aura of unnatural events were impossible to ignore. We broke camp with grim efficiency. Every sense screamed for us to run, but Flynn was adamant. We had a duty, a mission, and damn it, we would see it through. It was a thin argument, even to myself, but it was all we had to cling to. That final day is etched into my memory with agonizing clarity. Each rustle of leaves had me flinching, expecting some monstrosity to erupt from the trees. We came across more torn-up sections of forest, evidence of whatever had barreled through our camp two nights prior. But of the creature, or creatures themselves, there was no sign. It was almost dusk when we reached the clearing, our designated extraction point. Relief warred with a gnawing sense that it wasn't over. Flynn radioed it in, his voice clipped and tense. We waited. The minutes crawled by, each loaded with unspoken dread. It wasn't a chopper that arrived to pick us up. It was a convoy of black SUVs, the kind you see in conspiracy theory documentaries. From them stepped men in crisp suits, their faces hard, their eyes hidden behind mirrored shades. No introductions, no explanations just the air of authority that said they were in charge now. Flynn bristled, his natural defiance rising. What the hell's going on? Who are you people? One of the suits stepped forward. That information is classified, he said smoothly, along with everything you've just witnessed. The fight went out of Flynn. We were being swept away, erased from the official record. Whatever we'd encountered was now beyond our reach. The ride back was silent. Eliza stared out the window, her face blank. Wilson fidgeted nervously, no doubt dreaming of firewalls he couldn't breach. I just felt numb. It was like a nightmare made real, the realization that the world was wilder and far more dangerous than any textbook acknowledged. We were deposited back at some nondescript government building, ushered through sterile hallways, and finally crammed into a briefing room. Another suit, this one with a higher pay grade, stood waiting. I understand this was... irregular, he began, his voice dripping with practiced condescension. He launched into an explanation, a carefully worded speech that boiled down to this. What we saw didn't exist. We didn't see it. And if we knew what was good for us, we'd never speak of it again. In the weeks that followed, there were more debriefings, thinly veiled threats, and the quiet assurance that our careers, our lives, would be ruined if we slipped up. Flynn raged at first, then retreated into sullen silence. I quit. They offered a severance package, hush money to keep me quiet. I took it. Wilson disappeared. Whispers were that he'd gone off-grid, paranoid, and raving about things nobody should ever know. Eliza. I heard she stayed, delved deeper into the world we'd barely glimpsed. Maybe she was braver than me, or maybe she was consumed by a need for answers I no longer had the stomach to chase. The aftermath for me is a life lived in the shadows. I jump at every creaking floorboard, every flicker of movement outside my window. I dream of those pulsing lights, of the sleek, 
impossible thing that moved beneath them. The fear never fully fades. Sometimes, I find myself scrolling late at night, hunting for scraps of similar stories online. Conspiracy forums, blurry photos accompanied by wild, desperate claims. And a small, guilty part of me wonders, are there others like me out there? Others who witness the impossible, who carry the weight of a terrifying truth? The thought offers a strange kind of solace, because even in a world that will never believe us, it's a comfort to know we aren't alone in the dark. My name is Cade Thompson, and this happened to me on October 6, 2003. Folks assume anyone in my line of work is some kind of thrill junkie. Truth is, I'm not. Married, two young kids, I crave routine after seeing what I see on those secret missions for the government. But hey, they pay well, and well, those mouths gotta be fed. This particular assignment was out in Washington State, remote part of the Cascades, all big pines and glacial lakes. Picture postcard stuff, until you remember what locals whisper about out there. Sightings of something big and hairy, hikers gone missing, the usual Bigfoot-type rumors. My team consisted of me, point man with more field experience than I care to admit, along with Ramirez, our tech expert. Dr. Evans, the wildlife biologist with a skeptical frown permanently etched on her face, and Novak, fresh-faced and straight out of Quantico, figured it'd at least be a routine debunk the local legends gig. We spent two weeks setting up camp, tracking transects and placing camera traps. Zilch. Locals started giving us the side-eye, muttering about wasting taxpayer dollars. Honestly, part of me agreed. Even if cryptids were real, they're usually smart enough to avoid our gear. But orders are orders. Night patrols were when the boredom turned into creeping unease. Woods like that, they get awfully quiet. No crickets, no frogs, not even the wind seemed to catch in the treetops. Silence like that throws you off, gets under your skin. Then came the break, and it wasn't on any of our fancy surveillance. A ranger radioed in, body found, half-eaten, claw marks, the works. Up on a ridge, overlooking a ravine. Perfect ambush spot, whatever did the job. Up we trekked, the mood grim. Sight was a mess, worse than the usual bear attack. Blood spatter over an area way too large. The remains, well, let's just say it took Dr. Evans a while to confirm it was even human. Claw gashes were precise, not the frenzy you expect from a wild animal. Bigfoot with a butcher knife? Novak joked nervously, but nobody laughed. Evans ran her scanner over the remains, face creased in concentration. Inconclusive as usual, but the wounds, the... efficiency... It's unsettling. She finally looked up, catching my eye. We both knew you see enough weirdness in this work. You get a feel for when something ain't just nature acting wild. Night fell quickly. We decided to post guards, me and Ramirez taking the first shift. Crouching in the shadows, rifle ready, I scanned the ravine below. Moonlight was weak, and my night vision goggles only did so much. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a branch, had my heart thundering. Hours passed. Nothing. Ramirez whispered a joke to lighten the mood. That's when we saw it. Across the ravine, Maybe two hundred yards away, a figure materialized from the darkness. It was tall, too tall for a man, and hunched over. At first, I thought it was a bear, reared on its hind legs. But then, it moved into a shaft of moonlight. The skin was pale, almost translucent, with thick, corded muscle visible underneath. Arms were way too long and hung almost to its knees. The head... That's what made me truly lose it. Balding skull stretched long and narrow, and where eyes should be, there was just smooth skin and a gaping, lipless mouth. It turned its head slowly as if sniffing the air. Sweet Jesus, 
Ramirez breathed next to me. It cocked its head at the sound, then, with a sickeningly smooth motion, it dropped onto all fours and charged. We opened fire, the gunshots cracking through the silent night. The creature staggered under the impact of our bullets but kept coming. It was inhumanly fast, zigzagging through the trees like a damn monkey hyped up on meth. Panic flared in me. This wasn't some reclusive Sasquatch. This was a predator, intelligent and bloodthirsty. We retreated, firing behind us to slow it down, stumbling back towards camp. Ramirez screamed. I spun around. He'd tripped and was tangled in some exposed tree roots. Before I could reach him, the creature was on him. What followed was a blur of screeching gunfire, something snapping with a sickening wet sound, and then a terrible gurgling silence. I aimed my flashlight. Ramirez was... It was hard to tell what was even left of him. The creature had ripped him apart with a ferocity that turned my stomach. I stumbled backwards, blind with terror and rage, and then I was falling, tumbling down the back of the ridge into the ravine, hitting my head on a rock, everything going black. I woke up to a cold dawn seeping through the trees. My head pounded, and my leg throbbed in a way that meant broken, but I was alive. The creature was gone. I dragged myself towards the trail, a crawl that felt endless. When I stumbled back into camp, it was to find the remnants of a nightmare. Tent shredded, gear scattered, blood and a lot of it, but no bodies. Evans and Novak vanished. I called for backup, voice choked with a horror they wouldn't believe. The cleanup crew arrived. Standard protocol, sanitize the area, no trace left of the dead or of what killed them. They patched me up, confiscated my notes. I saw in their eyes the same thing townsfolk had looked at us with, a mix of pity and the quiet certainty that I'd cracked under the strain. Back home, the nightmare started. Dreams of that eyeless face and gnashing teeth, of Ramirez's screams, of the little girl's torn and tattered dress I'd found half-hidden near the base camp. Yeah, we never caught on to that part. The creature hadn't just been hunting us. It had been collecting. I started drinking heavily and snapping at my wife, the steady life I'd craved crumbling in my hands. They offered the desk job, the early retirement. I refused. I got transferred instead, requested some place hot and dry this time. Figured, no trees, no cryptids. But I know better now. They're out there lurking in the blind spots at the edge of our vision. And they're getting bolder. My name is Ethan Carter, and this happened to me in October of 2015. I'm a hunter. You know the kind. Loves the outdoors, camo gear, the works. But that's not why I was in the backwoods of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. That was work. I'm part of a group we call ourselves the Watchers. It sounds kind of cheesy, I know, but the name stuck. It's a government group, off the books, unofficial, deniable. We investigate the things no one else wants to admit exist. Cryptids, Bigfoot, werewolves, whatever bumps in the night people whisper about. Mostly, it's wild goose chases and hoaxes, so when this assignment came in, I figured it'd be more of the same. It started with a series of missing persons cases in and around the National Park. Nothing unusual for such a vast, remote area. Hikers get lost, accidents happen, but there was something off about these disappearances. No trace, no gear, no bodies, nothing like animals might have gotten to them. The locals started talking about Bigfoot. And yeah, we've looked into those sightings before. But this felt different. There were three of us sent out. Me, Jackson, and our team leader, Harris. Harris was an ex-military man, the textbook definition of a hard-ass. He'd seen things. You could tell just by looking into his eyes. Jackson was more my speed, a tech whiz who loved bad jokes and Star Trek a little too much. We set up base camp a few miles from the latest disappearance. The Olympic forest is dense, almost claustrophobic. 
It's beautiful in that primeval, unsettling way. I remember that first day. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. I felt... watched. For two days we hiked trails, swept search grids, found nothing but old footprints and deer scat. Harris was getting impatient. Jackson was bored. We were all starting to believe this was another dead end. Then came night three. We'd made camp in a small clearing. Just after dusk we heard it. There's no way to describe that sound. It was human-like, a cry but twisted, wrong, and the volume. It echoed through the trees like nothing I'd ever heard. Jackson swore under his breath. Even Harris looked shaken for a moment. He flipped on the radio and ordered all units in the area to converge on our location. We wouldn't be alone for long. That night stretched on forever. We huddled near the fire, rifles at the ready. Each crackle of the flames, each rustle of leaves had me jumping. Something was out there, circling us. I'm not a religious man, but I said a prayer or two. Just before dawn, Jackson whispered, Look. In the dim pre-light, I saw it. A figure, hunched under the heavy branches of a cedar, about a hundred yards away. Massive. Taller than any man. The way it moved was wrong. Limbs too long. Jerks and twitches unnatural for anything human. Harris raised his rifle. I hesitated. None of us knew what we were dealing with, but a gut feeling, that primal instinct, told me that firing would only make things worse. As if sensing us, it turned its head. Massive eyes shone in the gloom, reflecting the dying embers of our fire. Then, in a blur of movement that defied its size, it vanished into the trees. Reinforcements arrived as the sun broke. But there was no sign of the creature, no footprints despite the soft ground. It seemed impossible for something that big to just vanish. We expanded the search, teams sweeping the forest for miles in every direction. Nothing. A week later, they called us back. We were pulled off the case just as suddenly as we'd been brought in. They gave us the standard debrief treatment, signed the NDAs, promised not to talk, receive our sealed envelopes of payment. Harris refused his envelope, tore right into it, and stormed out. That was our cue to leave. Out in the parking lot, Jackson caught my eye. You saw it too, didn't you? He said in a low voice. That thing, it wasn't natural. I nodded. What do you think it was? Jackson started the engine, his eyes on the road ahead. I don't know, but you can bet we'll never find the answer in any official file. Months later, I can still feel its eyes on me in the dark. I dream of that clearing, that unearthly cry. The missing persons cases in the Olympics went unsolved. I have no doubt the creature is still out there, lurking in those ancient forests waiting.